Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, a popular resistance broadcast of hot news out of the region. In partnership with Code Pink, Common Frontiers, Council on Hemispheric Affairs, Friends of Latin America, Interreligious Task Force on Central America, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast Thursdays, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on YouTube Live. And you can find us on three channels now at the Convo Couch, at Code Pink Action, and at Popular Resistance Org. And post-broadcast, you can find our program on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Telegram, and at popularresistance.org under podcasts. Today's episode, Decolonization, Multipolarity, and the Demise of the Monroe Doctrine. And that's the title of an article we're going to be discussing um, today. And I'm really, really um, excited and honored um, to introduce all of you to my friend and fellow activist, uh, Fred Mills. And Fred is joining us from um, Maryland today. I'm actually speaking with you from Cali, Colombia. So let me tell you a little bit about Fred. He is a professor of philosophy at Bowie State University and deputy director of Council on Hemispheric Affairs. And I think all of you probably know Council on Hemispheric Affairs, as I mentioned earlier, is a broadcast partner of the program. Um, he researches and writes on ethics, philosophy, U.S. Latin America relations, and has recently published a book, Enrique Dussel's Ethics of Liberation and Introduction. He's the master at that. So before um, we start our conversation, I want to um, I want to read to you, all of you um, the opening paragraph of Fred's latest article, which is um, entitled the same as we've uh, titled today's broadcast, and this will give you a really good idea of uh, of the conversation we want to have today, and it's very very succinct as to what is unfolding um, in Latin America and the Caribbean in this moment before our eyes. So. December 3rd, 2023, will mark the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. It will also mark its obsolescence in the face of popular resistance and the pink tide of progressive governments in Latin America that have been elected over the past two and a half decades. The prevailing ideology of these left and left of center movements rejects the Washington consensus and opts for a new consensus based on the decolonization of the political, economic, social, and cultural sphere, spheres. Excuse me. This consensus is accompanied by encounters and conferences that advance lib uh, liberatory traditions developed since the 1960s, as well as those deeply rooted in indigenous cultures it is Washington's failure to respect and adjust to this political and ideological process of transformation that precludes, at this time, a constructive and cooperative U.S. foreign, foreign policy towards the region. So, th so that I'm going to share with all of you the link to the article because it's really very thorough in discussing this subject. And it's so timely, Fred, because we have just finished a two-year process of well, and with one more election in Argentina next year, two years of, of elections throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, starting with the return of the MAS in uh, MAS in uh, Bolivia in October of 2020. So let's talk about what is unfolding and how significant it is. I mean, before we went live, we were talking that it's really pretty much uh, impossible to undo what is unfolding at this point. Yeah, first, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to uh, dialogue uh, with you on this important topic and also uh, to acknowledge uh, the co-authorship of William Kamakato, with whom I've had a very productive dialogue uh, on these issues. What we're witnessing, I believe, in this last uh, few years of the election of left and uh, left of center governments is an irreversible trend, uh, not just uh, in terms of pushback against neoliberalism and foreign domination, but on the positive side, uh, a vision uh, of the possibility mm -hmm. of having a sovereign 
Americas, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, and of building post neoliberal forms of economic uh, and social life. The conquest was not just a conquest of people's bodies and land, but also an attempt to occupy their minds, uh, mm -hmm. to, pose, to position Europe and later US Europe as the leading edge of history with a divine mission uh, to civilize uh, Amerindia. And what we're seeing today is a tremendous pushback, not only in terms of trying to construct a post neoliberal order, but in decolonizing the mind and culture, which is a precondition of making these advances. Well, it's really um, the conquest and you and using the and using the Catholic Church, the home, the, the the empire of, of the church to do the uh, the psychological warfare, as we would call it today, and uh, yeah, really. Uh, very profound and, and to, to me that's why it is so important that we see and i would give evo morales and bolivia in in current history the the accolades for this the, the the importance of uplifting recognizing listening to and learning from indigenous people to undo all of that European conquest on every level, including living with the earth in a, in a healthier manner. Yeah, I, I agree. We, we cannot say that uh, this idea of decolonization started uh, recently. Uh, so it has its precursors in Tupac Amaro indigenous uprisings, uh, later uh, the Bolivarian cause. Uh, and so what we saw, as you mentioned in Bolivia, was really a fascist coup. And it had uh, obvious elements of white supremacy with the humiliation mm -hmm. of indigenous peoples. You know, the image of pouring paint, forcing an indigenous woman to kneel in the street and pouring paint on her, bringing this huge Bible, um, yeah. a picture of, uh, of the so-called President Janine Añez, bringing the huge Bible in uh, and uh, really, uh, there was a great threat to this plurinational state, a state that recognizes and even cultivates this plurality of, of nationalities. Uh, and yet the resistance for one year was fierce and relentless, led by indigenous peoples and the political organization, uh, the MAS, the movement towards socialism. And within that year, they were able to recuperate their democracy. And so if Indigenous movements were invisible to some in the North. It's impossible for them to be invisible today. Well, let's talk a little bit about, and our audience knows this is a recurring theme, but it's so, so important, how it was possible, because the Moss is such a perfect example of how it was possible to have an elected government overturned in a coup and then returned to power within a year. That's significant. And that has to do with, with the MAS, their social, as a social movement, as a political movement, political formation, community organize, all of that it was paramount to returning to power. So how did the coup happen in the first place? Uh, we had an extreme partisan as secretary general of the OAS, and unfortunately, he's still there, Luis Almagro. And really, uh, he and his electoral commission instigated doubts about the legitimacy of the election. Uh, and there's empirical evidence uh, by prestigious organizations, CEPR, -E MIT, uh, that went over these election results mm -hmm. and did not find any serious irregularities. And yet, this intervention of uh, Luis Almagro and his uh, electoral commission uh, actually, uh, I think, evoked in the extreme right in Bolivia the specter that they can now seize power. And lo and behold, they were able to do this temporarily by force. 
and, tempor and tempor temporarily only because there was a nationwide movement, community by community, that was organized, was, I would also argue, the political formation within the mosque, because you're consistently developing new candidates to run for uh, electoral office. And then you're able to, um, to take power through constitutional means, through electoral means versus, you know, anything more violent. And uh, that's really, that's really playing out across the Americas right now. I'm speaking um, to you from Colombia today, and the social movements are going to be a big, big factor in how much power the new government here in, in Colombia actually has. You know, just because you're in power doesn't mean you have power. And there's going to need to be a lot of um, organization and support from the communities up, showing the newly elected president and vice president they support him in what they want. But it's also a message to the opposition when the opposition sees what the people want as well. Yeah, it I think can't be ignored. This is a critical theme, this relationship between constituent power uh, and constituted power of the state. Mm -hmm. and. Chavez recognized early on the critical importance of what he called the civic military alliance, that in times when uh, the Bolivarian project was threatened with, and as we've seen in recent history, assassination attempts, military, uh, uh, mercenary incursions, uh, an ongoing economic uh, blockade of the country, that the only way to sustain a resistance under such pressure is to have this alliance with the popular sectors, with the people who voted you into power in the first place. And the loss of that connection uh, between constituent power and constituted power uh, basically ends up undermining the sustainability of the state. And also uh, the theme of governing obediently is critical here. And there's some self-criticism going on now, especially in light of the opportunities the left has uh, to look at the errors of the past. And one of those errors is that in some circumstances, that link between popular power and the state began to erode. And so now to, to correct this, I believe, there's a growing consciousness, uh, for example, in the Morena party, uh, of the need to maintain uh, Morena as a movement, not just a political party. Yeah. Well, we saw that um, really in Ecuador, didn't we? Difference between how Alianza uh, País with Rafael Correa creating a fabulously su successful electoral platform with his party, but not a movement, which perhaps if that had perhaps if that had been in place, the election result been very different. And I'm not I'm not criticizing our friend Rafael Correa, but it is a lesson to be learned. And it's an it's a good good example of the difference between uh, an electoral platform and a and a movement. And Morena was created originally as a as an electoral platform as well. I mean, it, it you know helped put. AMLO into power by building this huge electoral that it now is evolving into a social movement to, to help advance the programs. This is really important for those constitutions that only allow a single term. Like here in Colombia, Petro and Francia can serve one four-year term. In Mexico, AMLO can serve one six-year term. So it's, there has to be some sort of formation in, in place for the continuum of the project. For instance, when we were in Congress last, uh, last week in Bogota, um, one of the senators, Sen Senator Hayel, she was quite powerful in her talk last, uh, last Tuesday we were there. And, um, you know, she was really clear that Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez have four years. Pacto Histórico is a 20-year project. 
And so how do you ensure you have to have constant education, growth, movement building, candidate development coming? This is a 20 year project and the current government only has four years. So you're going to need ensuing candidates to keep moving the country and the project forward. And that's where I think it's not, I think we talked about this offline, where this is a project throughout the Americas in different ways, in different countries. It's, a, it's the genie cannot be put back in the bottle. This has emerged, this, this desire for the national sovereignty, natural resource sovereignty, and governments that, are, that have economic programs for the majority of the citizens. That's where Latin America and the Caribbean is in this moment. Yeah, this is- And that uh, can't be undone, I don't believe. Yeah, if, if we look at recent uh, gatherings of regional associations, CELAC, uh, ALBA, the Pueblo Group, uh, Abyayala Soberana, uh, we see a common theme and it's the recognition. Uh, and a part of this recognition, I, I, I think is informed by all of this uh, uh, consciousness and study of, uh, and criticism uh, of modernity, of the idea of some divine right that Europeans in the US has uh, to dominate the cultures and economies. Uh, no, this is a thing now of the past, it's over. And that's why Monroeism is doomed. Uh, so there's this uh, consciousness of a new opportunity uh, to advance the cause of, of sovereignty. But one of the conditions is multipolarity. And this is why we stress in the article that only in a multipolar world uh, can the Latin America and the Caribbean avoid domination by any a one superpower. And by diversifying their trade relationships, they also, also benefit from uh, the economic uh, and even cultural relationships uh, that they, they can develop with a variety of nations. So these are legs of the same stool, uh, sovereignty, integration, and multipolarity. Well, let's talk about integration because this was the theme of the CELAC summit in uh, Mexico City, September of 2021. Um, after a four-year pause, the president of Mexico reconvened CELAC. It was very, very significant. And maybe before we talk about that summit, we should talk about what to me, and you do mention this in your article too, to me, the most important speech in the Americas in the year 2021 was AMLO's discourse of July 24, 2021, on the 238th anniversary of Simón Bolívar's birth. It was significant. And in New Mexico, everybody was pretty excited. Regardless of politics, people were excited about the theme of that discourse. And one of, well, one of many themes, I guess for the audience, I've shared this with you before, that um, you know, he did a brilliant job recognizing the life and times of Simone Bolivar and how and how Bolivar understood the Americas and the ex and the westward expansion of the United States. He was really clear about that and, and what that meant for the rest of the Americas. But also this idea by the OAS. <laughs> and, and the U.S. State Department, but defined by the entire region. And, you know, he, the president actually called for the dissolution of the OAS. He talked about regional economic integration with the rest of the world, creating a block, an economic block that could, uh, that could uh, interface with the rest of the world. So it was a really profound, I mean, and I will share with you, Fred, I think a lot of us in Mexico at the time, you know, this is, this is how, like, his dream of what foreign policy should look like, what the Americas should look like. Little did we know that it was his actual foreign policy and economic policy that he was out laying out, because the following month, he announced that Mexico would be hosting the Venezuela Dialogue, that was 
August of 2021 and Salak. And so here we are just watching more and more unroll. Yeah, I mean, it was very profound. AMLO comes onto the regional stage with that great speech uh, you mentioned, uh, calling for, you know, that's enough. Uh, end of this Monroe Doctrine. I really do believe it was the best speech in the Americas. <laughs> yeah, and, and this made him a major player. Yeah, I really feel that. Uh, in, in, in the hemisphere. And this uh, appears to have been lost on Washington when just a year later, uh, Washington hosts the Ninth Summit of the Americas and doesn't invite the governments that it has targeted for regime change. And this inspired, I think, those two alternative summits, one, the People Summit uh, in Los Angeles and the Workers Summit uh, in Tijuana. And uh, just five months after that summit, the Puebla Group met. And the Puebla Group consists of visionaries, former presidents, uh, and other leaders in Latin America. Uh, and they met uh, and came up with a declaration uh, that... Uh, really, I think, set some of the themes uh, for the regional agenda. Uh, things like uh, uh, gender equality, uh, the free movement of people, the ecological uh, transition, uh, the defense of the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, and uh, I think probably of chief importance uh, to advance regional processes of integration. And then just a few days later, you see uh, leaders in South America calling on the presidents of South America to reconstitute uh, UNASUR. And UNASUR uh, has been moved, their headquarters from Ecuador uh, to Bolivia, uh, because under the former president uh, Duque in Colombia, uh, they left the organization uh, and uh, in Ecuador, the building, the headquarters was confiscated. So we see all of these yeah. uh, these uh, meetings, and uh, we have to mention sovereign Abyayala movement, indigenous uh, organizations from 16 different countries met mm -hmm. uh, in just uh, uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, uh, and again made similar declarations, but uh, included the idea of plurinationality as one of their guiding principles. So I, I agree with you that, that this, uh, uh, speech of AMLO opened up a space uh, and inspired, I think, uh, yeah. it reinvigorated the movement toward uh, sovereignty and integration. It was such that it, it was an ingenious speech in many ways on July 24th to use, you know, semen and bring it to today. Because there is so much unfolding. I would let's talk about the Salak Summit for a moment. Um, this was September of 2021 in Mexico City. And I, I'd like to talk about that because to me it was I it's it's a the whole five hour summit is actually on YouTube. And I have watched the whole thing more than once because it's so was so fascinating to me. I don't think it would have been as successful as it was without. Also, Fred, I would argue something really unique has happened um, in the, the in Latin America and the Caribbean. Not just this um, emergence of sovereignty and political wanting, economic integration. But there was, and I think you can see this watching the sun, there was um, a humanitarian element, despite politics. There was a, a humanitarian uh, scene um, unifying the Americas ever in my lifetime. And I think that was a direct result of the global North, specifically the United States, not assisting Latin America and the Caribbean during the pandemic. I think something happened on a very humanitarian level 
between all the countries south of the U.S. border. It was really clear, you're on your own, you're dispensable, you know, you're dispensable. And uh, I think that really comes through in a lot of the, uh, the, the, the talks at the summit, the Salak summit. Yeah, I, I think that- There's a unity there on a, in, in a different way. I, I agree. I think the I'm sorry, pandemic- I didn't <laughs> Yeah, the pandemic revealed the utter inhumanity of the sanctions. Yeah. But these are, you know, the word sanctions is a euphemism. These are illegal, unilateral coercive measures. And the sanctions killed kill campaign. Uh, the last uh, two reports of the United Nations on sanctions uh, uh, against countries, not only in Latin America, but beyond, demonstrate without a doubt that sanctions kill. They cause hardship for hundreds of thousands of people, and they've caused tens of thousands of deaths just in Venezuela alone. And to continue this during a pandemic really I opened the eyes of doubters about the intentions of uh, U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Latin America. Because if you really cared about freedom and democracy, one of the first things you want to do is defend human life. So yes, the values of defending human all life. All human life. <laughs> all human life. Yeah. Not just the white Christian people from Europe. I'm sorry, I had to say that. No, no. That's, that's really what it's, it's what it's been like in this hemisphere for the last 500 years. Yeah, that's been the dominant. Um, let's talk a little bit about... Um, Oh gosh, I've got tons of things I want to ask you. So let me pick a few here. That um, so coming out of the Salak summit, there was a real uh, an agreement on the need for in, uh, for economic integration, and uh, even Guillermo Lasso of Ecuador, the right wing president, said overtly that um, he wanted to be able to trade and interface. Uh, with all, all of the world, Russia, China, Iran, and the United States. And I think this is important because not everyone in the region wants to exclude the United States in order to move forward. There is room for the U.S. and Canada to participate, but there needs to be an evolution on the part of Washington and Ottawa. I think um, AMLO specifically, and now the new president here in Colombia, Colombia are very overt that there is space at the table for the United States, but for them, the table is round. The table is not the table that's being created in the, in Latin America and the Caribbean is round, where everybody uh, is an equal in voice, in in politics, in representation. Yeah, I don't know that that's something our country can embrace, but that's, that's, the overture is there. The overture is always there, even from the countries that are targeted for, quote, on regime change. Yeah. Um, you know, Maduro has never uh, taken uh, direct talks with the United States off the table and right, right. now is uh, quite eager to continue the trade relationship. Uh, so really... Uh, uh, if the principle of sovereign equality of nations is respected, uh, then instead of the unilateral coercive measures and the intent to destroy the Bolivarian revolution, uh, if those things can be transcended, uh, which I don't think is going to happen immediately, uh, then there can be some genuine, I think, constructive uh, relationships between the United States and Latin America and the Caribbean. Right now, in relation to Venezuela, we see these talks going on uh, in Mexico, and uh, it appears that this does not signal that uh, the U.S. Uh, is ready to accept uh, the Bolivarian cause, but rather that now uh, they're looking more toward an electoral process. Mm. Uh, to try to uh, uh, change 
uh, the governmental formula uh, in Venezuela? Well, oh gosh, um, I just want to say one thing about about Venezuela because this is something that and the and the dialogue that's happening between the elected government and the opposition. This is something that I don't think we talk about enough in the states, and it's not it's not well enough known either, in my opinion, that the opposition as defined by Washington is Juan Guaido, Leopoldo Lopez, that 2% of the very wealthy, very extreme, violent right. Yeah. The rest of the opposition actually does participate in the electoral process. They're not very organized. They haven't done a lot of political formation. And they admit this themselves, that they have weaknesses they have to overcome and they have to, you know, a lot of party development and, and those things that they have to do. But that part of the opposition, we don't talk about in the States, or at least, you know, the mainstream media doesn't. And it's significant. Is they are, they are, they full out admit they don't support uh, the current process in Venezuela but they believe in constitutional change, not violent change. They believe in constitutional changes, which is why they still form parties and participate in the electoral process. And I think that that is really, really important. And it also, to me, shows in a very, in a general way, or maybe perhaps more deep than that, this shift in Latin America and the Caribbean, this shift to dialogue, this shift to really overtly recognizing constitutional processes, valuing those, and you and and affecting change that way. Yeah, in the in the last election in Venezuela, uh, COPE and Acción Democrática, Democratic Action, they these are the major traditional uh, parties uh, in Venezuela. They participated in the electoral process uh, and. One of the things that's going on at the table in Mexico, as the opposition tries to extract uh, as much concessions as they can, is that uh, the government um, of Venezuela was also able to set some conditions that the parties not support sanctions, not support an outside uh, intervention in their country, and that uh, um, the Camila uh, uh, Saab, Saab uh, that she be an official delegate at this negotiating table. Uh, and this uh, this was a very important uh, condition uh, because it keeps in the forefront the illegal jailing of Venezuelan diplomat uh, Alex Saab. And there's going to be a hearing on the 12th of December uh, with regard to his diplomatic status. Uh, but he should have never been arrested in the first place. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of nuance, a lot of interesting things going on with these negotiations. So for our for our audience, Alex, uh, our audience will remember we've done a couple, we've done a couple episodes um, regarding his case, one about a year ago with John Pilpot out of Canada, just to talk about the extrajudicial reach of the United States, which hopefully is ending here in the Americas. And then we also um, had an evening, a, a film premiere and an evening discussion with Camilla and Carlos Ron, who's the vice minister of North America uh, for the Venezuelan foreign ministry. So I can share with the audience links to um, those two episodes too, if, so you can get a little, a little refresher on that. But that extrajudicial reach of just completely ignoring, not accepting, the diplomatic status of a foreign official. I mean, that's just one more, that's probably global Monroe is <laughs> specific to Latin America. I mean, yeah, he was, he's yeah. in prison because the United States basically didn't recognize, I mean, they don't like what he was doing on behalf of Venezuela, but to just overtly disregard his diplomatic status was. Yeah, and, I, and I think the real motivation uh, was that, uh, Alex Saab, through all his business contacts uh, from his from the past, uh, he was able to put those to use in circumventing uh, the sanctions against Venezuela so he could bring fuel, food and medicine into the country. Uh, and that's uh, what I believe made him a target, not uh, the unsubstantiated charges uh, 
that were levied against him. No, he was, he found a workaround. <laughs> so let's, uh, I promised you 30 minutes, Fred. And so, <laughs> as always, I just so love talking to you. So I have a few other things. Let me just go through my list here because I, um, what do you, I guess in closing, let's talk about what, well, I guess maybe the failure of the, summit of the americas and how i think to me at least how that's like really showed this crumbling this decay of the oas of u.s dominance of the region and of course so much of that had to do with omlo's announcement on may 10 that um he wasn't going to go uh to los angeles mm -hmm. Uh, because Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua weren't invited. He did send his foreign minister, but he did not um, go on it. He didn't send Mexico on uh, equal, what would you say, equal diplomatic status. It wasn't president to president. That, um, And I, I give him a lot of credit for, for saying that. And you could really see because other presidents followed suit. And there's a real crumbling that we're witnessing now. I wouldn't even say dismantling. It's really kind of just crumbling. Yes. You know, William Kamakato and I looked back at uh, the failures in U.S. policy, even to um, achieve their own objectives. They put together the Lima Group. Washington put together the Lima Group, this uh, coalition of right-wing governments in 2017, well, that coalition no longer exists. Its, right. its, its presidents were either uh, removed for corruption or voted out of office. And even the headquarters of the Lima Group itself, uh, Pedro Castillo was elected and said, hey, this thing doesn't exist anymore, okay? His foreign minister uh, said, you know, this thing doesn't exist anymore. And all the attempts, uh, everything in the book of regime change used against Venezuela, uh, they've all failed. And now the secretary general who had a significant uh, leverage in the past when he had uh, these right-wing governments to back him, uh, he's now on the defensive with mm -hmm. charges uh, of improprieties and his own behavior as secretary general. Uh, and so we see on all different fronts, uh, the failure of, of US policy to recognize that uh, the Bolivarian cause of regional independence and integration is irreversible. And we already live in a multipolar world. It's not yeah, that we're striving exactly. to attain it. And so the failure to adjust to these facts on the ground uh, basically undermines the very uh, uh, purpose that the US has in trying to retain some influence. At the very moment that the US was uh, ramping up its attack on Cuba, uh, the president of uh, Cuba, um, Diaz Canal, went on a trip to Turkey and to uh, China and to Russia. Uh, Algeria. Algeria, uh, fortifying those relationships and hammering out some uh, economic uh, accords. And so it actually, you know, the attempt to uh, bring about regime change in different countries and to re-dominate and assert its hedging, it's just not working. And so it's time to change course, but it would take a very radically new posture of Washington toward Latin America. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I'm not sure that's possible in this particular moment. I think it's inevitable if the US is gonna survive. But I'm not sure that in this moment we're going to see it happen. I hope in my, I hope in my lifetime I do. <laughs> but it's there's options now. There's there's this whole other world that has a, has emerged, specifically economic powers that have emerged. And you know you can't you can't put Jack back in the box. Those I and mean, that's a terrible you you know. But I mean, really, you can't. These countries have emerged. They are not going to be put back down. And that that's the new reality, as you said. We already live yeah. in a multipolar world. And we should say that it's not just left and left of center governments that are champions of multipolarity. 
it's across the political spectrum. Uh, yeah. All of CELAC yeah. participated in the China uh, CELAC forum. It's not just uh, the progressive government. So for right. sure, um, you know, this, as you said, the, the genie is, is out and is not going to be put back. Yeah. And it's very exciting. It's a little dangerous to precariously, you know, yeah. in some parts of the world, but it's, it's really exciting what, what has emerged and what is growing. So, so thank you, Fred. I'm just oh, so thankful for your time. Always so wonderful to see you and talk with you. And um, I should just remind our audience, you've been watching What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean. We're a popular resistance broadcast. You can find us on YouTube Live, 7.30 p.m. Eastern every Thursday. And those YouTube channels are The Convo Couch, Code Pink Action, and Popular Resistance Org. And uh, be sure to catch us next Thursday. Thanks again, Fred. Thanks for inviting me, Terry.